Hello, good evening students. I am Dr. Ruchi Raj, your original guru for prosthodontics. We are all gathered here today on this platform to discuss the most important MCQs for your upcoming INI CET exam. We had done this session once before for your NEET exam also. So let us begin discussing what is important for INI CET from the subject of prosthodontics. If I generally divide the syllabus of prosthodontics for your up upcoming INI CET exam, I would say the majority of your questions are still coming from CD as well as RPD. Then I see 20% of questions coming from FPD, 10% of your questions coming from implants, maybe some maxillofacial and 10% is all miscellaneous. It could be anything, but the majority trend that we see in our paper is usually coming from complete as well as partial dentures. They are mainly concept-based questions, clinical questions also. Whereas what we see from FPD is a very straightforward question that is based primarily on theory only, not much of twisted questions. If you want to uh, compare CD, RPD and FPD, I would say CD and RPD will have some conceptual questions. It will also have some tough questions also. But what we see from FPD is very straightforward questions coming mainly from the components. From the implant section, if we want to see, what do we see in the implants? Implants is mainly, I would say, focused around the components of implants and some basic values around implants that we will further discuss in our session as we proceed today. And 10% question could be anything. It could be a tough question from even implant also. It could be something very miscellaneous like how TMDs could be asked or something from occlusion also. So the idea of doing such seminars or the idea of doing these sessions today live on YouTube is mainly to discuss some MCQs that are coming repeatedly from the same family of topics. So I remember last time for your NEET session, I had discussed Facebook. Now a variety of questions come from Facebook. Similarly, this time we have again evaluated all your past 10 years paper and I have taken out 10 topics that are repeatedly coming. The questions are coming repeatedly from the same family or the same topic source. And then through these 10 MCQs today, what we aim to do is that basically make you thorough with these 10 topics so that if at all something comes, it usually comes from this zone only. So you are thorough, you are able to answer. So by solving one MCQ, we are actually clearing out one topic for you. So let us start discussing it and uh, I'll just see whether we are there. Yes, we are there. Fine. So I think the, yes, the streaming is fine. Okay, so let us just see. Now, the first question here. What does the first question say? After placing a new complete denture, a patient exhibits cheek biting opposite the molars. The teeth were set in conventional anatomic relationship to correct the cheek biting now, what the dentist should do. From complete dentures, there is a very important topic, which is troubleshooting. This particular MCQ is coming from the same concept of uh, troubleshooting, which is management of overjet in your dentures. So, how does it go? Now, if we read the question again, what are they trying to ask? There is a new complete denture. The patient is exhibiting cheek biting. This is the most important uh, symptom that has been mentioned over here, which you should remember. Patient is exhibiting cheek biting, which is opposite the molar region. And teeth were set in a conventional anatomic relationship. Now, what is the problem here? So, first and foremost, the problem in this 
is less over z. So the problem in this here is less over z. When what is over z? The horizontal overlap of teeth. So naturally in all dentitions we are aware that maxillary teeth they are slightly ahead of the mandibular teeth and there is some normal horizontal overlap. The value is roughly 2 millimeters in a normal dentition. Now when the overjet is less and when we arrange the upper and the lower teeth in an edge to edge fashion like this. Something like this say this is your maxillary. And this is your mandibular dentition and we arrange them edge to edge manner like this. In such a case, you will face cheek biting. To correct this now, to create an overjet, what do we do? To create an overjet, we trim the facial surface of the mandibular teeth. So you remove from the facial surface of the mandibular teeth and by doing so now, the corrected situation would look somewhat like this. The maxillary tooth is going to stay the same, but after correction, the mandibular tooth will look somewhat like this. So you have trimmed the facial surface in this region and created what was, what is needed over here is this horizontal relationship, this horizontal relationship which basically by trimming the facial surface you are creating an overjet here. So in this problem if you look the problem of cheek biting is because there is less overjet and so as to create the overjet as we can see now so as to create this overjet we have trimmed the facial surface of the mandibular tooth because by doing so maxillary teeth will become ahead of the mandibular tooth right so you are creating that overjet which you have not done ideally it should have been done in your teeth arrangement but you have not done it or there is some say processing error because of which this has happened so in that situation what do you do you trim the facial surface of the mandibular molar so as to create an overjet like this and hence now if you read the question again the teeth were set in conventional anatomic relationship to correct the cheek biting, what should the dentist do? The dentist, should he trim the central fossa of maxillary molars, the lingual cusp of the maxillary molars, facial surface of the mandibular molars or facial surface of maxillary molars? So from here, it is very clear, facial surface of mandibular molar, this is your correct answer. This is what we select in our exam. Now the same question is sometimes asked as, there is continuous cheek biting to the patient in the region of molars. What is the issue? The issue is reduced overjet in this case. Sometimes patients even face what is called as, now this is something extra that we are teaching you over here, something which is called as tongue biting. In the case of tongue biting, instead of the facial surface of the mandibular molar, you are going to trim the lingual surface so as to create the horizontal overlap and prevent the formation of tongue biting. So another question which can be produced from the same series could be on tongue biting. But generally what I have seen is that a lot of questions come in the exam from the topic of troubleshooting in complete dentures. So troubleshooting in complete dentures is very important. Certain another question will come pertaining to swallowing. What is the problem when the patient experiences problem with swallowing or there are soreness on the crest of the ridge? These are all different questions that come very frequently. Recent papers have shown that questions pertaining to overjet are asked more. So this is the answer to this particular question. Now the second question that we are discussing here, what is the question asking us? Primary stability in a micro implant is obtained by what? The options are cortical bone, flute of the implant, length of the implant and diameter of the implant. Now pertaining to implants, what we have seen, like I just discussed in the beginning right now, out of implants, 
what is very important for the success of implants is your primary stability now for long term success of implants mainly implant stability plays a very big role and implant stability is measured usually at two stages first is primary stage and second is your secondary stage the primary stability of the implant which the question is also asking us the primary stability of the implant comes from mechanical engagement of the cortical bone this is a simple straightforward theory based one line answer how does the primary stability of the implants come from it comes from the mechanical engagement of the cortical bone so if we look at the question here primary stability in the implant is achieved by what the answer is option number a which is cortical bone by the threads which are engaging with the cortical bone you get your primary stability and this primary stability is very important for long term osseo integration as well as success of your implants now as an extra point over here just remember something about secondary stability now the idea here is what primary stability has come as a question sometimes secondary stability can come as a question so the family of topic remains the same but the question changes so you learn something around these important topics also so that if at all the question flips and changes you are confidently able to answer so let's come back to secondary stability secondary stability is developed from the remodeling and regeneration of bone and tissue around the implants so secondary stability remodeling and regeneration of bone and tissue around the implants one more point which you can remember secondary stability is affected by your primary stability so how good primary stability do you have that is going to affect your secondary stability so the question was very straightforward and very simple primary stability in micro implant is achieved by what it is achieved by mechanical engagement with cortical bone and primary stability is mainly because of cortical bone secondary stability is by the remodeling and the regeneration of bone and tissue around the implants now let us see something slightly an extra edge point in stability how do you ideally measure implant stability ideally implant stability is measured by histologic analysis histologic analysis is very invasive basically taking it out and seeing the histologic section of it or there is something called as a push and pull pull out test that is ideally the best way where you can do but clinically how do we check clinically we check it i'll give you three techniques here there are a bunch of other techniques but clinically how do we go radiographs second very commonly used perio test and third rfa the radio frequency analysis the full form is radio frequency analysis right so we took about four to five different mcqs from this one small topic what is primary stability then how is it primary stability affected it is because of cortical bone then what is secondary stability and another question ideally how do you measure stability but clinically what are the different ways now your question could be what is the just a second what is the use of 
perio test and from the name you may think this is used for some periodontal say pocket depth checking or something related to perio but actually it is related to measuring the stability of implants so this is how you may think this is a new question but it comes from the same family of topics so that was your second question now the third question is what i cannot stress more the importance of pontics in fpd if something if you want to read one topic from fpd just one i would not advise you to go to exam reading only one topic but if you want to read just one topic from fpd keep it as pontics it is that important ini may cet your 2023 had a question imaged based question on prosthodontics in pontic sections only in the textbook of uh, sorry in the topic of pontics i had discussed in in our recall sessions you can just have a look in the playlist which is there on the in this particular channel only dbmc i mds you can go through the playlist of past videos and see there i have discussed it i am keeping same question but something again different over here to explain you pontics because they are very important right so let's look at our question first pontic with a concave fitting surface is what is it modified ridge lap is it hygienic is it bullet shape or saddle now concave means this this is called as a concave pontic so the correct answer here is saddle this also resembles the saddle that you see on your horses that is how the name has been derived so the correct answer here is saddle what are saddle pontics now saddle pontics they overlap buccal and lingual surfaces of the ridge and usually see now currently if you see saddle pontic is not indicated the reason is a lot of food entrapment in this region and food entrapment happens with other pontics also but they are cleansable here it is non cleansable you will not be able to insert any aid for interproximal cleaning or under the pontic cleaning any other aid that clears of that food so when that does not happen it leads to a lot of inflammation and overall failure of the fpd so not indicated actually but in a very high aesthetic demand and when you have no other options only then we still use saddle pontics but we still keep you rather go for a modified ridge lap rather than using saddle pontic right so that is the question concave fitting surface saddle pontic is your answer in your ini cet of may 2023 the question was on modified ridge lap so let us now explain you the different kinds of pontics briefly over here the first is sanitary or hygienic now as the name suggests here hygienic means it is good to keep hygiene over here that is why the name is hygienic so hygienic pontic keeps about 2 mm of gap like this between the ridge between the ridge and the pontic ideally now when you keep such gaps you cannot put it in the aesthetic zone otherwise you will have all food lodged over there there will be a black space seen through it is an aesthetic where do you keep it in low aesthetic zones which is like a posterior mandible so posterior mandible usually no patient you would be able to see posterior mandibular tooth when even if they smile wide so posterior mandible indication what are the advantages very good access for oral hygiene give them like a nice thinner proxa brush they would be able to put it through the pontic under surface and they would be able to maintain and clean it right that is the advantage disadvantage it is very obvious you have very poor aesthetics with this kind of fpd so that is the disadvantage what are the indications now all of these non aesthetic zones 
non aesthetic zone now with pontex also i'll give you one tip if you know what is the difference between an aesthetic and a non aesthetic zone of the mouth you would be able to remember all indications of pontex so aesthetic zone is everything that is seen when a person smiles so your anteriors premolars even some patients maxillary molars also that is your aesthetic zone non aesthetic zone is your typically lower molars even in the widest of smile you will not be able to see the cervical part of your mandibular molars you may be able to see the occlusal part of it but not the cervical part so that is your non aesthetic zone right contraindication absolutely you cannot give it in aesthetic zone and usually it is made of all metal now saddle pontic we just recently discussed only what is saddle pontic what is a conical pontic conical pontic is something that has like a pin point contact with your ridges usually you give it in molars where there is no aesthetic requirement you just maintain a pin point contact it the it does not harbor any food around it it has a very nice convex surfaced pontic does not harbor much food around it maintains a very pin point positive contact with the ridge so good access to maintain hygiene in general but very poor aesthetics so just probably indicated in the cases of posterior mandible no other cases now this was a question in your inicet may session exam a question of anterior tooth and modified ridge lap so what is modified ridge lap where it is a combination of your saddle and hygienic that the buccal surface of the pontic is overlapping the ridge but the lingual surface is cut out like this so you keep an open access area where the patient can put some sort of cleansing aid and clean whatever the debris is collecting over there so by overlapping the buccal surface you are maintaining the aesthetics but by keeping the lingual surface open you are actually giving some aid so as to clean the lingual surface or the under surface of the pontic so that is a modified ridge lap it is in a very high aesthetic requirement like your anterior teeth or even your maxillary molars of those patients where it is visible on smiling someone who smiles very wide and their molars are also seen in those patients you can give modified ridge lap in that case and what is ovate pontic ovate pontic is in fresh extraction sockets you plan it before you do extraction and you utilize the socket by immediately giving a temporary restoration with the fpd so what happens is the socket will contour around the fp uh, the pontic of your fpd and will the tissue will adapt and contour likewise and will shape so what in one line if you describe ovate pontic looks like tooth emerging out of the extraction socket so all of this extra effort is made for your aesthetic zone only so usually maxillary anteriors where you if you are planning to give fpd the tooth is going to go under extraction you can prepare your ovate pontic now to solve image based questions out of pontics i'll give you one tip in may ini cet the question was showing a image similar to this the question was identify the type of pontic and where it is used with your textbooks remember for anything whether it is indication or even a common example wherever that particular item is used or wherever it is seen very commonly that will be shown as an illustration so where modified ridge lap is used it is used in incisors more commonly so that is why that incisor is used as an illustration if i give you an example of say diseases or conditions that are seen in oral pathology where it is seen more commonly that will be shown as an example or as an illustration so something say supposedly is seen on say say some condition is seen on palms very commonly so the illustration will show palms so if you are going through your textbook if you just remember that image also you automatically know where it is seen very commonly that is how illustrations are made in textbooks so if a question comes like this in your exam you automatically should be knowing that this is where it is used very commonly the image is already shown over there then that should be the indication so it was a very easy and a straightforward question just some common sense can be utilized and answer you don't actually sometimes need to know the topic also if you use just some presence of mind you should be able to answer it so that is your next question 
Coming on to the fourth question, if incisal guidance is to be increased, what should be done? Should you increase the cusp inclination? Should you increase the condylar guidance? Should you flatten the compensating curves or should you decrease the condylar guidance? Now, whenever we do balancing, For complete dentures, we have learned something which is called as Hanau squint. Hanau squint is basically five factors. You have condylar guidance, you have incisal guidance, you have compensating curves, you have plane of occlusion, and you have cuspal inclination. These are all five factors. It's an interplay of all five factors. Now, with your condylar guidance, we know it is fixed always obtained from the patient. So, option number, decrease condylar guidance. This is wrong. Increase condylar guidance is wrong. The reason is condylar guidance value is obtained from your patient. Now, what happens and what is the role of incisal guidance with other components? Let us just have a look. First, what is incisal guidance? Incisal guidance is the angle that is formed by the amount of vertical separation. This is the vertical separation between the upper and the lower teeth in the anterior region. That is also called as the overbite. So the amount of overbite that you see between the teeth, when you view it from the sagittal plane, when you view it in your sagittal plane. So this is the sagittal plane, divides the body, in the right and the left half. So if you take this sagittal section and you view it from the side, you will see upper and lower incisor like this. So the amount of separation that we have, the angle that you see, that is called as this incisal guide angle. Now, to not go into very many details of balancing, I'll just briefly tell you how we introduce balancing when we balance for complete dentures. It's that this value is fixed. This is your condylar guidance. That value is always fixed. Now. If the value of incisal guidance is increasing to balance that, you have to increase cusp inclination. True balancing, it has been described in Hanau's textbook of full mouth rehabilitation. True balancing, if you want to see, it comes when this condylar guidance, incisal guidance and your cuspal inclination, all three are say supposedly of the same angle. So all three are the same value, suppose say 20 degrees. You will have true gliding of maxillary teeth and man mandibular teeth over maxillary teeth because that is a mathematical relation. If all three angles are going to be the same, just you can visualize it also. If all of these three angles are going to be the same, they will move like a plane. The mandible will glide over maxilla if all three values are same. But clinically, if we see, that never usually happens. So now what do we do when we want to keep that balancing and say incisal guidance value is increasing? So as to balance that out, what do we do? We increase the value of this cusp inclination. If we flatten it, your balancing will be lost. So let us look at the options here now. If incisal guidance is to be increased, what should be done? You should increase the cusp inclination or flatten the compensating curves. Definitely increase your cusp inclination. That should be the correct answer. In any situation, any option that always says changing condylar guidance, just simply cancel it out. That is never your answer. We can never change condylar guidance. So you can automatically cancel those options out and now look at the other options. So that is your MCQ number four. Simple question, but a question that generates a lot of silly mistakes in exam. Surveying is not used in or Surveying is not used for what function? Surveying fixed ceramic veneer crown, making intracoronal attachment in the model cast, modifying the contours of tooth in the master cast or measuring an undercut. So the correct answer here is modifying the contours of the tooth in the master cast. Contours of the tooth are not modified using a surveyor. What is a surveyor now used for? 
read the options very carefully what is a surveyor used for surveyor is used to survey diagnostic cast contour wax patterns a lot of students don't know that surveyor is used to contour the wax patterns also then measure undercuts then this is also a point that a lot of people don't know surveying ceramic veneer crowns and placing intracoronal retainers so remember these functions of surveyor now out of these i know you are aware of these functions of surveying and maybe even measuring the undercut but remember these three also it is used to contour wax patterns survey ceramic veneer crowns and place intracoronal retainers in a parallel fashion so sometimes you may feel what is the role of surveyor in a laminate or a veneer crown there is a role of it don't forget it that is also one of the role of surveyor which is why i have kept this question because from surveying uses is a very simple straight forward question but something where silly mistakes can happen so we don't want silly mistakes so the correct answer here is modifying contours of the tooth in the master cast coming to your next question image based question i have kept one image based question identify the kind of complete dentures stomatitis is it type 1 2 3 or 4 this is a type 2 kind of a denture stomatitis why is it so let us understand so this is a classification now this is a question about remembering there is no concept over here you have to just remember the grades of the classification that were given by newton what are the different grades if there is a localized inflammation just a pin point or a localized inflammation present usually which is introduced by trauma say you have a nodule on the under surface of the denture which you didn't identify while delivering your denture while inserting it and that nodule is causing ulcers on the palate that is a type 1 variety of denture stomatitis type 2 is what we have seen in the picture over here of complete denture stomatitis what is it a generalized erythematous hyperemic situation of the arch so the part or the entire of the denture bearing mucosa would be involved why does this happen mainly happens because of candida when the patient does not maintain hygiene with the dentures and because there is collection of debris and food that is leading to inflammation of the under surface of the dentures which is why you will see an erythematous generalized hyperemia of the entire arch mostly it is seen in maxilla why do i say see the image over here it is a maxillary image so that also gives you a cue if between both arches you want to ask me where do we see it very common it is seen in maxilla very common the reason it is seen in maxilla the very commonly that is why it is used as an illustration also that is how even the formatting or making of books happen or how we present our information generally the illustrations or images are usually seen or taken from places where they are used very commonly or where certain things occur very commonly so that is another thing that you can remember here where you will see candida induced stomatitis more commonly in maxillary arch very commonly because you will have a lot of collection of food over there so that is type 2 we deviated slightly off topic but i hope you get what i'm trying to tell you so a generalized inflammation that looks like this see you can see a very nice differentiation also where the denture is ending this clearly shows it is because of poor hygiene with denture and now if the inflammation was not corrected in time over a period of time this inflammation turns into a granular type papillary lesion 
So you will see papillary outgrowth in the center of the palate. This papillary inflammatory hyperplasia is type 3 of Newton's classification of dentures stomatitis. So if you are shown some sort of papillary growth over here, it is class 3. So remember, pinpoint is class 1, just a generalized erythema is class 2 and papillary growth is class 3. The most common organism, which is another question from this topic, what is the organism? Candida albicans. It is the most common organism. Reason is mainly your poor oral hygiene. This is all reactions to complete denture wearing when patients does not maintain your hygiene. That is your sixth question. Now, one question or one topic. If you pick out papers from past 15 years also, you will see a question on shade matching. That is how commonly shade matching has come over the years. And it was one of, I would say, even when I used to prepare a controversial question, shade matching, right? So what I have done is, I want to discuss shade matching, but this is how mentality also goes sometimes by framing questions. Maybe I will not ask the same question. The same question is what? How many seconds should you do shade matching? Beyond how many seconds eye fatigue will happen? We have changed the question to what is the best time of shade matching of teeth so that the light is 5000 Kelvin. This is a question seen in the recent papers of your INICET. About 10 years back, you would see the question on shade matching and the seconds in which shade matching should be done. So the topic remained the same, but the question evolved over a period of time. So having knowledge of such important topics will help you a lot because it will help you mainly uh, understand, uh, uh, sorry, solve new questions that are coming from here. So the answer here is 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. In the time of 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., you have light which is at 5000 Kelvin. And that is the correct answer. The best time for shade matching of teeth is 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. where you have your 5000 Kelvin, which is considered the ideal light source for doing your shade matching. Another important point is when you are doing shade matching, if your eyes get fatigued, you should rest it on some colors like blue colors. So your eyes can rest over it and then you can restart shade matching. Another few important points with shade matching is remove any dark or uh, distracting colors from your field. So if your patient is wearing a bright colored top, cover it with a gray colored bib or a gray color cloth so that it becomes neutral. The field becomes neutral for you. Then next, what do you do? See your patient is wearing a bright lipstick. Ask your patient very politely to wipe it off so that you can accurately do your shade matching. Preferably do it in a very nicely sunlit room. Rather than using artificial lights, you get a lot of color corrected lights also these days. Try to do it in a nice sunlit daylight lit room in the time of 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Ideally, you should do your shade matching within like first 5 to 7 seconds. Beyond that, our eyes get fatigued. When your eyes get fatigued, you can rest your eyes and then you can restart your process once more. When we do tooth preparation, the correct way to begin with shade matching is before you do your tooth preparation. The reason is that once your tooth becomes dehydrated or dried, it becomes whitish or chalky. So your shade comes wrong. And the shade then you're recording is actually the stump shade, not the actual shade of the tooth. So before you do your tooth preparation, you should record the correct shade of the tooth. After you do your tooth preparation, you could even record the stump shade if there is some discoloration. So these are different points regarding your shade matching. Here presently, it's a very theoretical question. What is the best time for shade matching of the teeth so that light is 5000 Kelvin? Correct answer is 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Now, um, one question from maxillofacial processes. Classify the following mandibular defects according to Cantor and Curtis. You can see a mandibular defect where you are seeing that a segment of entire mandible is missing. The correct answer for is this is it is a Cantor-Curtis class 2 defect. 
let us see the entire classification when we used to i analyzed the papers i see a lot of armani classification being asked for maxillary obturators and in mandible the canter and curtis classification is very important so from maxillofacial you just do these two classifications if you are short of time this will cover something for you if a question is asked so let's have a look at canter curtis what is class 1 class 1 is radical alveolectomy so you are removing the alveolar process of the mandible but your continuity of the mandible is maintained in this classification you see the basis of it is what part of mandible is removed and whether continuity has been maintained and if it has been restored or say uh, surgically corrected to restore it back the continuity what has been done for it right so that is the basis of canter curtis classification class 1 is alveolectomy removing the alveolar process but maintaining the base of the mandible that is your canter curtis class 1 canter curtis class 2 what we saw in our question is a mandibular lateral resection distal to the canine area so beyond the canine area you removing entire part of the mandible nothing over the continuity or restoring it anything has been mentioned in canter curtis class 2 what is class 3 resection mandibular lateral resection to the midline so midline resection is class 3 if you are taking from the cuspid onwards it is class 2 if you are taking from the midline it is class 3 class 4 surgical reconstruction and lateral bone graft is used to restore it so you are restoring the continuity back or restoring using a graft so you are doing surgical reconstruction and lateral bone graft over here that is canter curtis class 4 canter curtis class 5 is you are removing the anterior part of the mandible but you are surgically reconstructing it using a bone graft so you can see mandible has been cut from here and here on both sides but the continuity has been restored and if you do not restore the continuity you just remove that part of mandible then it becomes canter curtis class 6 where anterior mandibular resection without surgical reconstruction has been done so that is your cumulatively canter curtis classification of mandibular defects how mandibular defects are classified so two classifications from your uh, maxillofacial processes which could be asked armani for maxillary obturators or other maxillary defects and canter curtis for your mandibular defects what we see in the image over here is a canter curtis class 2 now this is a clinical question i have uh, included a wide variety of questions to discuss some were theoretical questions some were classification based this is a clinical question a question based on judgment so let us start discussing here 24 year old patient keep in mind this is a young patient that we are talking about has her lower right posterior molars extracted so lower right posterior molars are not there causing all upper three molars to supra erupt that means maxillary molars have supra erupted with 3 mm of space what should be your treatment of choice situation i hope you have understood 24 year old patient means a young patient all lower posteriors are removed so molars are missing all upper molars have supra erupted over here and you have about 3 mm of space what is this 3 mm of space this is our restorative space that means the space in which your restoration that means your fpd or implant or whatever you want to give totally should be accommodated in this space that is your restorative space so if i draw it for you say this is my maxillary teeth and this is my mandibular ridge this space total is 3 mm that sorry that is what the question is talking about now let us look what we are asking what is the treatment of choice see in such clinical questions if they want to confuse you they will include a lot of information over here 
which is totally irrelevant. When you read such a question, you try to register in your mind what is important and then read what they are asking two times. What are they trying to ask me? And then go through the options. So first option is intentional RCT of upper posteriors and then give prosthesis. So what they are saying is do intentional RCT of upper molars, reduce and give a prosthesis there. Or do lower alveoloplasty. That means reduce the mandibular alveolar process and reduce the height of the lower ridge and then give your prosthesis. C, very blunt uh, option, implant. What using an implant? Nothing has been mentioned. Fourth is orthodontic intrusion of maxillary molars and give your lower prosthesis. Now, as a rule of thumb, always remember, when any treatment choice is asked, you have to give the ideal treatment of that case. So, ideal treatment usually should be something which is the most non-invasive and something that protects the existing tooth structure first. So, remember your muller Van's law. What is present in the mouth should be protected or taken care of first rather than destroying it so as to bring or rehabilitating more teeth. That is your muller Van's law roughly. So, in this case, doing intentional RCT or alveoloplasty is actually removing healthy tooth structures of the mouth or healthy oral structures and then trying to rehab, which is actually wrong according to your rehabilitatory principles. So, the ideal situation is doing orthodontic intrusion of your maxillary molars and then when the orthodontic intrusion will be completed, you will gain some space over there which will be your ideal space for your prosthesis, then give your prosthesis. That is the ideal case. Clinically, we all know most patients do not go for such an elaborate treatment but never bring your clinical experience over here. Use your textbook knowledge and go by ideal means in such questions. So that is something that you should always keep in mind and answer while facing such questions. So that is your question number nine. And the last question for today's series is, which of the following is true about centric occlusion and centric relationship? CR is jaw to jaw relationship in which condyle is in anterior superior position. CO condyle is in most posterior position, centric occlusion is posterior to CR or CO is condyle in terminal hinge axis. There are three terminologies in occlusion which everyone should know I feel, centric relation, centric occlusion and maximum intercuspation. Now what do we mean by centric relation? Centric relation is a bone to bone relation. Centric occlusion is a tooth relationship and MIP is also a tooth relationship. How? I will tell you. What is centric relation? When the condyle is in the, when condyle is in the anterior superior position. So, you have your TMJ like this. This is your condyle, supposedly. My drawing is pretty bad, but just try and understand. Okay, say supposedly, this is your, uh, your fossa, this is your condyle. So, the maxillomandibular relationship where condyles will articulate with the thinnest avascular portion of the disc. I think I should correct my drawing. So, say suppose, now. Something like this maybe, fine. So there is a biconcave disc here. Now that maxillomandibular position where condyles, they articulate with the thinnest avascular portion of the disc. When, when does this happen? When this entire complex is in the Antero superior position against the slope of this articular eminence, against the slope of the articular eminence. So basically centric relation is that relation of the condyle when the entire complex or whether the condyle is in the most antero superior position against the slope of the articular eminence. So if you have 
this as the slope of the articular eminence the condyle will be in the most antero superior position over here that is what centric relation is right this is a relation where musculoskeletally mandible is in a stable position it is also the relationship where your mandible will rotate around an axis which is called as your terminal hinge axis so centric relation is the relationship of the condyle with your fossa or how the mandible is or the condyle is related with the articular disc with the complex in the antero superior position against the articular eminence it suggests a very stable position of mandible where your entire complex in a stable neutral position it is a repeatable position of mandible and a reference for rehabilitation this is centric relation it is a relation of upper and lower jaw to each other it has nothing to do with teeth this position is independent of tooth contact it has nothing to do where the teeth are located <coughs> it is your bone to bone relationship it defines basically centric defines how your bone is related to each other now understand centric occlusion when the mandibular condyle is in centric relation whatever relationship it is bet between your upper and lower jaw teeth that is called as centric occlusion it may not be mip also which is maximum intercuspation <laughs> but that is centric occlusion so the relationship of teeth when mandible is in cr position that relationship is called co your teeth may have maximum intercuspation at that point but sometimes they may not have maximum intercuspation and only few teeth may be touching and what is mip forget everything about condyle that position of the teeth where maximum teeth will intercuspate with each other that is called as mip maximum intercuspation it is very simple as the definition of the name suggests that position of upper and lower teeth where maximum teeth will intercuspate with each other that is called as mip so now we look at the options here what is correct about centric relation and centric occlusion option number a is correct cr is jaw to jaw relationship in which condyle is in the antero superior position now let us see why others are wrong here co is condyle in the most posterior position no co is a tooth relationship it has nothing to do with condyle co is slightly posterior to cr no that is also wrong co and mip have that relationship not your cr and co so that is wrong co is condyle in terminal hinge axis no centric relation is condyle in terminal hinge axis not centric occlusion centric occlusion is basically relationship of upper and lower teeth occlusion when your jaw is in centric relation position that is centric occlusion mip is irrespective of whatever situation of condyle is that position of upper and lower teeth where maximally the intercuspate with each other that is called as your mip so slightly confusing but something that students should know what we have seen is these concepts are very elusive to students when they are in final year bds or even as interns but suddenly this is expected of you when you are in a competitive exam when you are appearing for exams like ini cet where i would say the cream of the country is selected you can expect such concepts to be asked with prosto or any subject remember there is a balance of concept based questions as well as some theoretical questions theory or numericals is something that one has to rectify but concepts is something that you can build today and it can last you for very long so opt for a concept based learning up for an understanding of the topic very well and that is how you sail through these exams my all the best and very good wishes for all of you to get the desired result that you want in your ini cet and this is me signing off today completing your sessions if you have any doubts queries or any questions or suggestions for us put them in the chat box below and i will come back and i will solve those questions or queries for you so good night everyone and have a wonderful uh, studying session for all of you